Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Powers in Play, our monthly edition of a program looking at the global issues from a regional and Israeli perspective, but trying to cover the entire globe. And with us uh, are today our Supreme Leader, the Editor-in-Chief Jonathan Hassan, this time sitting in as one of the panelists. Hi, Jonathan. I'll give you back your seat shortly. Yes, sir. Good to be here. Uh, Reserve Brigadier General Dr. Amnon Sofrin, formerly with both Military Intelligence and Mossad. Welcome. Thank you. Our beloved Colonel Reserve Miri Eisen, again formerly with the Directorate of Military Intelligence, Prime Minister's Office, and many other uh, distinguished establishments. Lovely to be here. And former Deputy Foreign Minister, Ambassador to Washington, and a long list of uh, probably still secret endeavors, Daniel Yalon. Good to be here. Welcome to you. The subject is the person and the power. When we look at various powers, superpowers, regional powers, we'll get to lesser powers, we wonder whether the person leading them or about to lead them makes all the difference. So here we are, um, obviously a few weeks before the elections in the United States, but I would like to start, Miri, with lesser parties, Hezbollah and Hamas. We'll get to the bigger ones later. Is it uh, Hassan Nasrallah? Is it Yahya Sinwar who makes the difference, who lets uh, their organizations, they let their organizations punch above their weight? There's no question whatsoever that the person that leads has a really strong impact. But with both of these organizations, it's not just about the leader, which means that when Israel eliminated Sheikh Yassin 20 years ago, um, everybody was sure that would do something serious to Hamas. And here's Hamas 20 years later. Ismail Haniya is not around. And here's Hamas still out there. When it comes to Hezbollah, it's a bigger question. Because Hassan Nasrallah has had 30 years at the reins, that has its own impact, both to the strength of his leadership, but also to the weakness. Meaning if the series of decisions that he's made, certainly over the last decade, are perceived now in a challenging way, that's gonna challenge the leader, and that will have a big impact on the entire organization. Jonathan, um, Nasrallah and Sinwar are leading um, militias, entities, which are both political and military. And uh, one can hardly distinguish between the roles they play in such organizations. Does it matter if they are considered political leaders and then they are eliminated? First and foremost, they're considered to be social leaders. They're part of clans, they're part of compositions in their respective uh, communities, in their respective uh, countries. And therefore, we need to look at, from it, uh, at it from a social construct. What are the implications of their activities? Who are the people surrounding them? Who are the people who are influencing them? And therefore, there is much of the clan politics that has uh, a lot of significance, also on the broader scheme of things and uh, the broader politics. Each one of those clans has uh, their own affiliation to separate countries where they are also able to draw their own power, uh, be it uh, Saleh al who was uh, in charge of uh, the activities in Judea and Samaria at the time. He was seated in Turkey. He had strong connections with the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey and Qatar and other places. But ultimately, Turkey, when it decided to normalize relations with Israel, it was asked to expel that same individual. Did it impact the, the uh, relationship between Hamas and Turkey in a significant degree? There are question marks there. Nevertheless, the Iranians were able to exploit it and were able, once he moved to Lebanon, 
to operate from there in collaboration in concert with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, a Palestinian group, which is a proxy of Iran, as well as with Hezbollah, you saw this specific individual gaining significant power that ultimately positioned him within the organization at a higher stake. And therefore, the political aspects of their decision-making grants them that tool or decision or power to also employ military means that then also draws in the various clans to adhere to whatever he decides and puts forward. General Sofrin, um, in uh, your experience, um, among other uh, duties, you were the uh, intelligence officer for the Central Command when Israel and Jordan signed their peace treaty. And in both uh, those peace neighbors that Israel has, Jordan and Egypt, the question is, is it the ruler or the regime? When you and your colleagues looked at Amman and Cairo, did you try to follow what could happen once a certain ruler, such as Sadat when he was assassinated, what, would that change the entire regime and with it the outlook and the policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel? First of all, when you sign a peace accords between two countries, that means that uh, the leaders are leading that. Okay, in the case of Israel and Jordan, it was Prime Minister Rabin on one hand and King Hussein on the other end. There was secret and concealed links between those two leaders for many years. And therefore, the peace accords were signed quite easily or quite naturally. With the Egyptian side, it was a little bit uh, complicated because of other reasons. But nevertheless, when Sadat decided to sign the peace accords with Israel, and in return he got all Sinai Peninsula, except from the small piece of Gaza that he didn't want to get back, and it left us, left us to deal with that. And when Sadat was assassinated, there was some kind of uh, wariness within the Israeli government. What is going to be next? When President Mubarak got into power, is he going to change the policy or not? But he was obliged due to, first of all, economical reasons and the support of the United States. And that was the decisive uh, effect on his decision to go on and keep on going on with Israel with the peace accords. But when the period of preparing for the succession is longer, such as when King Hussein was terminally ill and it was known that he will probably um, let one of his sons take over rather than his brother Hassan, what um, was um, your job or the job of those who watched the regime? We were not, we were not uh, worried too much about uh, what is going to be the future of the relations between Israel and Jordan, because it was solid. We didn't have really disagreements before. So the small issue that was solved during this piece of codes actually was so solid that it couldn't be uh, ter thrown away with, without any reason, you know, just for the sake of somebody else. Danny, <clears throat> democracies, um elect uh, their leaders and uh, once every few years uh, they change them. Recently in countries such as Japan and uh, Great Britain, um, they swap their leaders uh, frequently, sometimes four times uh, in six years um, or so. How do ambassadors, um, whose job now is to watch the scene, more than to relay messages because the leaders converse directly. How do you prepare uh, for the eventual transition to a new president in Washington or prime minister in another country? Um, are you and your staff making sure to be in with the outs? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say that uh, if you are representing your country in a fellow democracy, in the case of Israel, you have to hedge simply because the always the political, uh, let's say, um, arena is not very stable, especially if you have a uh, democracies like in the par parliamentarian system. United States is a little bit different, but still you have to hedge by that, meaning that even when you are, of course, 
dealing with a incumbent or incumbent regime, you always meet the opposition. So if there is a transition, and sometimes the transitions could take place, you know, like in Britain, you know, over a month, then you always have your good connections. Uh, so this is not a real um, issue for, for embassies. The real issue is, of course, the policies. And this is something which is much bigger. And, and here I would say that there is an inherent uh, advantage for dictatorship. Uh, let's take Putin vis-a-vis Biden or vis-a-vis even Trump. Uh, dictatorships, you know, they stay for a long time. So there is a continuity with their, and and predictability maybe, with their policies and with their conduct. Uh, If you take um, Iran, for instance, Trump was very hard on Iran. He was replaced and the uh, policy was changed in a manner that allowed Iran to be where it is today. Uh, Putin, when he needed to support the Assad regime, he doesn't have anybody to uh, account for. He's making a decision and he's doing it. Now, I know, Amir, that you like and appreciate very much cliches. I like Assad. (laughs) The Assad family. So Uh, let me invoke Churchill who said, you know, Churchill said that democracy is the worst type of regime except there's none better. So (laughs) we are really, in in the long time, Always democracies win. We see it in World War I, World War II, and and even today. But it takes a long and winding road. And in the short time, unfortunately, the upper hand is with dictatorship as we see it now. I was thinking that you, Danny, are the worst panelists, except for all the others. (laughs) (laughs) So, so Miri, if, if we know that the incoming leader may change uh, his staff, his cabinet, his policy. What do we do, including intelligence uh, agencies uh, with their information operations? What do we do to prepare and perhaps shape the next administration in various countries? So I'm going to push back at your question a bit, because if we think that we can shape the policies of other countries, I'd say that's jumping on a very high hill that I'd be very wary about. You want to understand the policies. You want to understand the implications to yourself, and you certainly want to impact them. But I'm a little um, disturbed by the idea that we shape them. So what do we do? First of all, it's really important to have constant things. I think this is um, also in continuation to what Danny was saying before on the diplomatic front, that you want to have relations with what I'm going to call the mid-levels. Because the mid-levels bureaucracy, meaning the people like Amnon and myself, for that matter, Danny, who worked within the system for many years. The deep state? The deep state, mm-hmm. right? Okay. We're the ones, no, one. it's called yes minister and yes prime minister. It's the people <laughs> who are there, who are doing the actual work, and they don't change when everybody else changes. It's going to be a different type that changes. And if you have a strong relationship there, there is a continuity within all of the changes. Second aspect is really trying to understand beforehand, continuously, what are the policies? Were we surprised when President Trump changed the policies about Iran? Were we surprised when President Biden changed the policies again about that? Meaning if you know that up front, then you can take better action yourself in trying to impact, as I said, perhaps not shaping the upcoming changes in policies. Jonathan, you're associated with the Hudson Uh, Institute in in Washington, D.C. And think tanks are sometimes governments in exile. In addition to their day-to-day work, you consider uh, perched in in Massachusetts Avenue and other places, people who were with the former administration, hopefully their party will win. They will come back. Perhaps uh, they will get an upgrade to a more senior post, do they have any impact? They do. They do. Uh, Of course, we need to remember that think tanks are, uh, in essence, a 501c3, and therefore they cannot endorse a leader. They are in their own lane. They need to focus on their own lanes, and they propose policies. However, when we're talking about the people, for instance, in Hudson Institute, you have people like Nikki Haley, you have uh, Mike Pompeo, you have uh, General McMaster, people who were active participants in the Trump previous Trump administration. And if 
according to you know uh, the the circulating uh, um, chatter, if somebody like Mike Pompeo is going to assume the next role and he is heavily involved in writing a certain policy paper, naturally he is prone to take either all or part of that policy. But Kamala Harris said that she will appoint a Republican to her cabinet. Maybe one of those. Kamala she... Harris also said in the debate that she doesn't know about any Americans deployed in war zones. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, in a campaign, when, when we're hearing all kinds of things in a campaign, uh, ultimately what comes down to it when those people in the think tanks, be they in the right of center, left of center, right or left, uh, there are different individuals who are going to take this mid-level position or that uh, mid to senior level position that are going to have a lot more what, impact. What used to be called the Sherpas preparing the summit meetings. Right. Uh, Amnon, um, we see that Putin, uh, who was mentioned here, and Xi in uh, uh, China are strong leaders and are there for the duration. Um, is it really a constant or can there be sudden upheavals, assassinations, uh, uh, perhaps uh, some medical um, emergency? Can one prepare um, when you are so used to a Putin, can you prepare for a sudden succession? This is not a time of Brezhnev, Chernyenko, the, the Androp of the elderly leaders uh, of uh, a stagnant uh, Soviet Union. How can you prepare for a Putin succession, for instance? I don't know if you can prepare for that, because uh, still he's still quite young compared to Brezhnev or Androp of all these, 70. all these dinosaurs, okay, who are uh, very old, all of them. He's in good shape. He's in good health. Extreme sports. Yeah. Extreme sports, right. He's in good health. So I don't see that uh, something uh, unexpected is going to happen. And if, uh, if so, somebody from the inner circle will replace him. And the continuity of, of this policy will go on. It won't change. Same goes with, uh, with China. But only uh, last year, we had the uh, Wagner for Prigozhin all of a sudden descending on Moscow. Couldn't uh, such an event happen again? Of course it can happen again, but uh, <clears throat> the fate of Prigozhin and the fate of Wagner force was known to everybody. He dropped off from uh, some helicopter or some airplane out of the sky without any help, without any parachute. He didn't survive, unfortunately. And all the Wagner force was totally demolished and spread away. And they are now in Africa, most of them. They don't fight under what they call the Russian flag in Ukraine and so on. And everybody will send the message. So I don't think that somebody is going to try one more time to challenge Putin like that. If, then, I, yes, if please, I can just jump Mary. in onto that one there, Go ahead. it's an excellent example when we're talking about leadership and organizations and who does that of, so what would have been better, a Putin or something led by anything of the Wagner group, which was such a scary prospect upon itself, meaning it wasn't that that's the positive change that you're looking for, so that you don't know what to expect, but is that something that you want to look at? And I just think that we always have to step back for a moment and go, so what's going to come after the leader that we know? And even if it's a bad leader, could it be even worse? And that's a question both nearby, who's going to be after Nasala, who's going to be after Sinwar, no, no. but also far away. But we had our own example. Hey, or something else. In Lebanon. In Lebanon. Musawi right? and, and Nasrallah. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It's always the question, the devil you know, vis-a-vis -vis the devil you don't. Really? Maybe it won't be a devil. Maybe yeah. it will be an angel. An the, angel. The righteous angel. among the nations. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, uh, Miri no, there are no angels only in heaven. That's true. <laughs> Not here. Miri Elliot talked about mid-level officials, uh, people who would be in senior staff positions, uh, the, the constant uh, mechanism of government. Regarding elected officials, when you served um, at the Washington Embassy and, uh, of course, in other periods, Israel uh, used to, or at least tried to, cultivate junior 
relatively junior elected officials, uh, hoping that they will grow to become contenders and maybe leaders. You would uh, send uh, attorneys general from the states, mayors, governors. Can you talk uh, about that? Absolutely. I think, yes, uh, one of the secrets of uh, Israel's good relations with the United States is not just, uh, you know, what we know, the uh, the obvious, you know, fellow democracies and interests, shared interests and threats and all that. But also you have to have the personal touch. This is very, very important. When you don't have the personal touch, we see some, you know, uh, you see uh, Bibi Netanyahu vis-a-vis Clinton or vis-a-vis uh, Obama or vis-a-vis even Biden, you know, it wasn't the same as when you had, let's say, Rabin and Clinton. So, you know, you can really do things which are intimate and you can really forge a future together. Sharon and and, uh, Bush, George W., was the same thing. You know, they could really think of what to do. They had a trust of each other. Now we don't have the trust. We do not have the trust in the very upper levels. It influences the entire, I would say, uh, uh, echelon. So so there was a consul general um, in one of uh, the consulates um, in the southwestern, southeastern. In Houston, I believe. In Houston, uh, named Evroni, who took pride um, in discovering George W. Bush when he was the governor of Texas, perhaps even earlier when he owned the Texas Rangers uh, baseball uh, (laughs) club. And in the foreign ministry, it's a feather in your cap. You discovered a future president. Well, absolutely. But uh, does that mean that uh, this can uh, really gauge your future? I'm not sure. Uh, You mentioned this, uh, Mr. Vroni, which I appreciate very much. He really wanted, he uh, actually uh, uh, staked the claim to become ambassador when Bush was uh, elected. But I can tell you from... Uh, who did become ambassador? Uh, let me see. Here. Oh, one okay. sitting here. <laughs> among the... Amazing. And it's not me, Ray. It's not myself. <laughs> and it's not Jonathan. Let's just say Coincidence. Let's just say he's one of the panelists, but without right. mentioning, not, not naming names. But I will say here that um, it does make a difference, but for a very short while. The fact that, uh, let's say, the consul general in, in Houston knew very well the governor, Bush, it's in the beginning, you know, uh, the governor, he knows only him. So he would pick his phone and take talk to him and all that. But very, very quickly, he understands what is the balance of power. So very quickly, Bush and his advisors are reaching to the top, uh, to the prime ministers, to the foreign minister. And then the one who discovered falls very quickly by the side. Do you want to add, Mary? The cultivation of the future leaders is actually something which is incredibly important in democracies in the sense that both in the UK or in France, anywhere in Europe, but let alone in the United States, somebody who has been to Israel, somebody who has seen for himself what goes on here, those first that first exposure impacts the way they're going to see their policies as they go on. And in that sense, it may have been specific consul general or somebody else, but I've had in that sense, I like to call it the fun or the pleasure, where you bring in a variety of different people that come here, and they can be senators or governors. And what they view here, what they see here in the days here, they're gonna meet a variety. I think that that's been one of the strengths all of the years of looking at that variety, so that you're not just with the power in play, you're also looking at the future powers in play. And to me, the most important part, at least with the United States, is to continue to do so in a bipartisan way. It doesn't matter how we view the future. It's about the future of the United States and that all of the powers in play in the United States are supposed to be contenders and that we need to cultivate them all. Former Vice President Richard Nixon, before he became the candidate for the presidency and then the president, always mentioned that when he was out of power and seemingly not important, chief of general staff, it's Hak Rabin, took him on a helicopter a flight to the Golan Heights. When Rabin became the ambassador to Washington, uh, he had an entree into the uh, Nixon uh, White House. By the way, it was the same case with Eric Sharon and George W. When George W. was still a governor of Texas, Eric Sharon took him in a special uh, helicopter tour 
over Judea and Samaria, Golan Heights, and everything, and they remembered it, and, and, and Bush remembered it very well, and you know, took very kindly and was very fond of And Shabbat. then they landed at his farm and had a good <laughs> no, steak. But, but <laughs> what, what he did tell me, you know, according to American policy, they cannot actually visit the uh, Judea. They can hover. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> so, so he says what Sharon did, he instructed the pilot uh, of the helicopter to actually go down maybe 10 centimeters, centimeters over the, the ground. But so without touching the ground. Without touching the ground, yeah. Jonathan, um, there are uh, families of senior politicians who are Jewish themselves or married to um, Jews or their son-in-law or daughter-in-law are Jews and some of them convert to Judaism. Uh, we have Ivanka Trump and her husband Jared Kushner. Now we have the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff. Is that an influence or do they uh, stay out? Are they careful not to involve their faith, their communities, uh, so that there will not be any blowback? Well, naturally, when we're talking about American leaders, and, and that's what you're referring to, I, I think there is a factor there, uh, but it doesn't impact their decision making. Uh, to, to the degree where ultimately when you look at people like Antony Blinken, uh, he, he has his own understanding, a, a very activist type oriented uh, personality that had, of course, a certain um, uh, appreciation for the nation state of the Jewish people. Nonetheless, uh, he did always emphasize the humanitarian angle be it vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but not only vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis Egypt and other places. Um, to what degree is that impact? I think it's very individual. Uh, I think that people like Barney Sandals, you mentioned earlier, people who come to Israel and experience. Uh, I think Barney Sanders, who came here to the kibbutzim, had a, a complete different experience than other people who did that same trip. Uh, so we need to take everything with a grain of salt. It's very individual. It's very... Uh, focused on that. But uh, if I may take one step backwards, and I think that, uh, for instance, about the Bush uh, family, the, the majority of discussions about the biggest influence on the Bush family was not Israeli influence. It was Prince Bandar uh, of Saudi Arabia, who had a very close relationship with the Bush family and was able to leverage that for foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the kingdom and, and other elements in that. Uh, we can see uh, the levels that this influence has is not only about state actors, it's also about non-state actors. But, but Bandar, uh, of course, he represented uh, an important country, but it was also his longevity on the job. Uh, and now his daughter is the right. ambassador. And uh, Danny would have stayed uh, as long as Dobrynin or Bandar, <laughs> but he had a more uh, pressing business, so he <laughs> came back uh, to Israel. Yeah, I would never become the dean of diplomats in Washington, D.C. Like <laughs> Bandar did, yeah. Right. Amnon, uh, sometimes uh, prime ministers or ministers of foreign affairs or defense ministers go on to become the leader, the secretary general of an international organization such as the UN or NATO. Um, is there any uh, influence if you had a good relationship with them, a bilateral one? Does it carry on to the organization? Let's say, for example, NATO. NATO is a great organization with uh, 32 countries that are members today of uh, this organization, of this treaty. And this one is not there. And even though the next uh, or the current uh, commissioner, which is, uh, was <coughs> the former prime minister of the uh, Netherlands, is fond of Israel and likes Israel very much, but doesn't give us any advantage. Because there is a policy of the countries that are sharing this treaty and they don't want Israel inside. So the fact that he likes us and the fact that we have good relations with him doesn't affect us. But on the margins when, uh, of course, 
the Secretary of General of NATO is subject to the North Atlantic uh, Council, and the ambassadors uh, get their instructions from home. Right. It's very cumbersome. But on the margins, uh, sometimes, especially in emergencies, he can indicate to his subordinates that some Israeli requests uh, be expedited. He can do that if he decides to do that, it is, if it is according to the policy of NATO. Okay? As long as it's within the lines of the policy, it's okay. If it goes out of the, of the lines, he won't pay any concessions to Israel. Miri, you um, uh, have a lot of experience both with visitors and when you go abroad. Um, do most people you meet conflate the country with its current prime minister? Uh, when they, of course, it, it's very natural uh, to uh, personalize. When you talk with people, do they see Israel as Netanyahu or earlier uh, Bennett or even earlier Olmert or, and Sharon? There's a difference between Netanyahu and everybody else. Because Netanyahu has been so many years, it's become so synonymous of BB Israel that when you come in, you have to come in and say, I want to talk about Israel, and you talk about policies, but you need to present government policies. And to do that distinction between a government policy that at the end, Netanyahu was both in the 1990s, but he's been pretty persistent for over a decade, since 2013. That's a very, very long time. Um, I mean, 2009, 2013, it's such a long time. It's hard to separate. And the one thing that I have found that's different for Israel when it comes to powers in play is that most people are not willing to make that distinction. Meaning if you come in and you talk about the United States and you talk about the administration and you make a distinction between Democrats and Republicans, it's obvious to everybody that there's an administration and then there's all sorts of other opinions. When it comes to Israel, if you want to come and say, I can oppose the prime minister and I support what we're doing in the war, they're like, no, you can't do both. I'm like, you absolutely can do both. I can be against policies of the prime minister and support the overall effort of Much the state like of Israel. Much like a president and the Congress. Absolutely, but it's accepted about other places in the world. And for Israel, that's one aspect. And I, I think part of it is the longevity of a democratic leader in a country where we have had a democratic elected leader for many, many, many years. I'll remind everybody, he was elected once by name in the 1990s, but from 2009, it's by the coalition government. It's not that he's elected. And that's very long. There's, there isn't something to compare to that in the democracies of the world. Danny, you were in Washington uh, when the sudden transition from Sharon to Olmert took place. What was the reaction there of Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and the others? Well, initially, uh, I think there was some dismay because they really had very good rapport and understanding with uh, Sharon. If you recall, uh, uh, Amir, the entire engagement from Gaza was done together, you know, side by side, the American administration and the government uh, of Israel. Basically, it was the Sharon team and, uh, and Bush team and Condoleezza. Uh, so always when there is a uh, new uh, leader anywhere, uh, Washington goes into a, a, a tizzy. You know, they, are, they have a very, very, uh, I would say, a manual of what to do. And of course, they have uh, you know to gather all the, the intelligence about him. With Olmert, it wasn't too bad because um, uh, Olmert was the deputy of uh, Sharon, deputy prime minister, and Sharon used to send him every once in a while to Washington D.C. To get you, him out of Jerusalem. And <laughs> not only that, I, I well because he had to do something with him, and <laughs> what he told me, uh, Sharon was, listen, I, I have to do something with him. He is pressing for me to go to uh, to Washington, so I'm sending him to Washington. Arrange for him all the meetings but make sure he only listens and doesn't talk. So anyway... <laughs> Impossible uh, with all of and Anyway, <laughs> so it was um, after the, you know, the, the, the initial surprise, uh, they knew who uh, Olmert was. And again, the systems was the same. If you recall, the same people that, um, uh, you know, uh, surrounded Sharon kept with Olmert. So that is the way. And for that matter, uh, a Bush... And Olmert, you know, they're kind of the same age, age, same generation. In a way, they spoke to each other in a much easier manner than uh, 
Bush and Sharon. Yeah, because Bush looked up to Sharon. Exactly. <laughs> I'll just give yeah. one example. I think Danny and I were both in the room that time when President G.W. Bush at the time sitting opposite Olmert, and it was during the World Cup, if you remember that one there, where President Bush said, oh, soccer, that's the game where you watch the grass grow. And then they went on to talk about um, other other different sports. So, But they definitely had that one in common. They both liked sports. It was very interesting. They built a rapport, and you could see that there. That's in 2006, the Italy versus France. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And the, then it, it, mm-hmm. in the final. You know, the, the, the fruits came in 07 with the elimination of the, you know, the... Um, Nuclear, Nuclear reactor. But, but during that game, the um, Italian ambassador, um, whose residence is in Ramat Gan, invited the Minister of Foreign Affairs, whose residence was in Ramat Gan. He no longer lives there because he changed some of his um, familial connections. <laughs> but it was part of his cultivation of uh, the minister. Yes, go ahead, uh, Amnon, you wanted to add to, or to to subtract from what uh, Miri Miri said. Now, when when, uh, administration change, uh, does the uh, new one um, look askance at ties with the old ones, or vice versa? We know that in the transition between Obama and Trump, even though Obama was not a candidate, he served out his eight years. Um, The uh, Obama people did not like Israeli officials already during the transition between November and January 20th, um, trying to get in touch with the incoming administration. Do you, can you add to that? Well, you know, everybody here spoke about the personal relationship that is so important, Uh, be it people right now within the Trump campaign where you hear the personal relations being forged or being maintained to a certain degree uh, on multiple levels to maintain that uh, uh, relationship, but also with uh, the Kamala Harris uh, team. If you uh, see Phil Gordon, for instance, uh, he's somebody who has very close connections with different people here in Israel. Uh, But nonetheless, his policy is very similar to the incumbent rather than uh, the the one of uh, Trump. When we look at the big picture, and and I think that we need to understand that we're living in in very dire circumstances right now, particularly at a time when since 2022, we see the Chinese and the Russians uh, establishing a no-limits relationship mere few days before the Russian invasion into Ukraine. We see the, the uh, various joint maneuvers of Russia and China forcing the United States to abandon its posture of two aircraft carriers in the Middle East, uh, sending the uh, USS Roosevelt back to San Diego to its uh, home uh, in the Pacific in order to establish a counter-deterrent to Moscow and Beijing in the Pacific. We're seeing the uh, Americans understanding and comprehending the severity of uh, Iranian threats towards Israel and its allies and partners in the region, not only Israel. Sending now, yet again, the USS uh, Truman to bolster, once again, two aircraft carriers and one AOR, which is not something the Americans usually do, particularly not in the Middle East. So we're seeing a lot of those different things um, occurring right now, do I think that the the one administration versus the other are going to alter that posture within current circumstances? I, I doubt that. Uh, General Suffering, as a veteran intelligence official, can you at least satisfy some of our curiosity regarding intelligence chiefs who go on to become leaders, and we can name three, for instance, Andropov of the KGB, Bush, senior of the CIA, and Ehud Barak of military intelligence. And Putin. And Putin, who was not the chief, he was only a lieutenant colonel, but obviously kept uh, the legacy and surrounded himself with veterans. You know, when you look at uh, the Israeli military establishment. 
at least great part of the chief of general staff were the heads of the military intelligence before. If you look at Hatsia Levy, if you look at El Barak, if you look at others. Aviv Kohavi. Aviv Kohavi. And uh, Moshe Yalon. And, and they gave them a, a great advantage because they knew to look at the great picture and to look at the strategic picture and to try to analyze it by themselves, even though they were assisted and advised by others. Same goes with the prime minister. You have a great advantage when you know the intelligence work and you know how to direct the people exactly what you're looking for. Tasking. Yeah, correct. I think this is a great advantage, and I think that uh, these people gain a lot of power by using the capabilities and the knowledge in order to get more information and more uh, intelligence picture, a broader picture that will assist them in uh, decision making. And sometimes, not in Israel, of course, when such an official meets a counterpart, he knows that the other guy knows that he knows that this is a source earlier used <laughs> by intelligence, and this is for another time, of course. General Sofrin, Jonathan Hessen, Miri Eisen, Ambassador, Deputy Foreign Minister Daniel Elon, thank you. And we will be back with another edition of Powers in Play next month. For the time being, Shalom from Jerusalem.